talking that you're in Madison. Yeah, Wisconsin? I live in Madison, Wisconsin, actually just right outside of it in Sun Prairie. Okay. And are you from uh, Wisconsin? Yeah, I grew up in Oshkosh, the place that's famous for all the overalls and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I've lived in Wisconsin in various locations for my entire life. Okay. And what? so what's Wisconsin like? I mean, I've never, I've, I've been there often, but I've never lived there. Well, people always think of cows and cheese, and there certainly are cows and cheese. But in my daily life, I almost never see cows, um, although I do have a lot of cheese in my refrigerator. Um, it's basically green, and you've got four distinct seasons. Um and I think I live in the nicest part of the state in Madison, although I'm sure other people would would disagree. But yeah, I like it. I mean, I've lived here my whole life. And other than like the middle of winter when it's occasionally 40 below, um, I don't think about moving. Yeah. How do you deal with the winter? A lot of people don't want to deal with that or they get to a certain age. Like I think you said you were retired. Um, I, I, I retired from my corporate job. I took early retirement to, to do children's books full time. But um, I basically stopped shoveling snow last year for the first time. I was able to hire someone to come and shovel my snow, which, you know, is a little like, you know, privileged, but it made a huge difference because now I look outside and go, oh, that's pretty, but I don't have to go outside and deal with it. But also, I mean, you are giving somebody work because some exactly. people, yes. once people say like, oh, I, I hire somebody to clean my house or shovel, but then at least a person can make some money. So Yeah, exactly. And it, it, it isn't cheap either. So, I mean, yeah, I've right. got that. They come whenever it snows and that made winter a lot more bearable. And I'm, I'm very happy, usually, you know, in the worst of it, just staying happily inside my house. That's good. So what I want to talk to you about is um, because I, I talk to media people. But what's interesting about you is you went from the media to corporate to creative. And a lot of people would love to do what you're doing because you write children's books right now. But yeah. what did you do in the media before? OK, so um, in college, I was a double major in journalism and English, and my initial goal was to be a sports writer for the Chicago Tribune. That didn't happen, but I was a, a sports writer for some Wisconsin newspapers, you know, and that was back when newspapers were, you know, a, a bigger, more thriving industry than they are right now. Um, but I worked as a sports writer in several Wisconsin newspapers. Then I moved over and was sort of a, an all purpose feature reporter um, for for different newspapers. Um, which I really love because I like, like you said before, I like listening to people. I like hearing their stories. I like sharing their stories and figuring out the best way to tell them. I was never much of like a, a hard news, like, you know, your house just burned down. Tell me how you feel. I, I was much more human interest. Um, and then an opportunity came up in the insurance industry, which normally wouldn't have been my first choice, but it had better hours and, and better pay and was just a little more predictable. And so I moved over to that and was there for, you know, almost 30 years for two different insurance companies writing about all different kinds of insurance coverage. I learned a lot. Well, did you write internally or what kind of writing were you doing? I was doing internal writing because like they were big companies with like thousands of employees and there was like a corporate internet site and every day that news would be posted on it. Um, and so I would, you know, what, what do the, I always looked at the employees as being like a, a small town or a village, like, you know, and so I figured my job was to give them the information they needed, like maybe a little local newspaper would have. So I was writing feature stories about, you know, different products that were being introduced or people in the company who were doing interesting things or staffing changes, or, you know, here's how your benefits are changing and what you need to know. Um, so I, I always approached it like I was on, you know, a, a journalism beat. And my audience was the employees working for the company. Hmm. And did you have to do PR type stuff or do you just did the internal stuff? I did a little bit of PR, but I was much more of a, a backup person on that. It was mostly talking to the employees. And then the, the other big thing was, you know, some executive would say, oh, we need to tell employees about this topic. And they'd start talking about it. And it was all corporate buzzwords and like, like way, you know, above the pay grade of, of most people. And my job was to like understand it and then simplify it and make it as interesting as I could so that an employee would actually read it and not just like get through the first paragraph and go like, who cares? So I, yeah. I developed a very strong dislike of corporate jargon and a very strong commitment to putting it into like real words that, you know, you could understand and go, oh, I know I see why this is important. Yeah. Cause I was gonna say, you know, um, I think journalism is like that. I mean, I think newspaper writing is different than broadcast journalism because for broadcast, you have to break things down. This is for TV and radio. Yeah. And, but did you also have to do that for newspapers, breaking concepts? Yeah. I had to break it down, you know, and simplify it. And I guess, you know, understand it, simplify it, make it interesting and tell it in a, in a way that made it seem almost 
like a story. Um, so it was sort of like a, a multi-step purpose that I had to do. And then, you know, executives would, they always wanted to be quoted and they, they, they'd send me their quote or I'd talk to them and it would be like, just, you know, we're going to synergize our key corporate competencies at a granular level so we can, you know, um, better optimize our, our core competencies. I'm like, what? <laughs> it sounds like layoffs. Is that, does that mean layoffs? <laughs> yes, often. <laughs> but mostly, you know, it means we're going to look around and see what other people are doing and we're going to try to do it better. I'm like, well, then just say that, you know, um, you don't have to talk about benchmarking your core competencies. You just, you know, we're looking at what other companies are doing and seeing if we can like exceed their performance. I mean, it, it's just, but people get so used to hearing that at meetings that then they just start talking that way. And I don't think they even realize that it's not clear. Well, what, how did they feel about you changing their language? Usually, you know, because everything got reviewed, it wasn't just me writing things and putting it out, I would send it back to them. And I'd say, I think people will understand it better if we say it this way. And usually they'd be like, sure, you know, um, other times they'd say, well, I really want to do this. And it was a little bit of a, a back and forth. I mean, very rarely I'd get somebody going, I want it the way I wrote it. And I'd be like, okay. Um, but usually I could, you know, ex- they would see the value in making it something more understandable. Hmm. And then how did you, when you were writing for newspapers, how did you avoid doing the, the violent type of stories and crime? You know, I just got lucky. They put me on a feature beat. I mean, one time somebody's house had been destroyed and they sent me out to do that. And I was, wasn't happy about it because it's just not my thing. Um, but other than that, like I, my, my job title was always like feature reporter or columnist or, you know, something that didn't require me to go out and do, I mean, I covered my share of like, you know, local sewage board meetings, which again, wasn't, wasn't great, but mostly I just ended up on the future beat. Okay. Well, I mean, yeah, people sometimes downplay having to go to these meetings, but that's government and the media has to cover the government. Oh yeah. Has to, has to. It's just, my preference was always people, you know? So I guess even when I covered the, um, the meetings, I'd be like, what's the human interest angle. Or even when I was a sports reporter, I would always like try to start out with the people angle of the story, um, and then move into, you know, the other parts of it. Well, when you did uh, sports, I mean, what kind of sports were you into personally that made you want to write for the Tribune? Well, I mean, I played basketball um, when I was in high school and I wasn't great. I mean, I lettered, but I was not great. Um, and I just really liked basketball. And then I kind of got pulled into covering, you know, baseball and football. And I mean, initially, and this is going to show how old I am, I covered American Legion summer double headers where I would watch both games and write two stories. And I made $15 for doing that, you know, and that was like, my entire, like most of my day, you know, $15. And I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, even today, a lot of media markets don't pay well. Like, so for instance, no. um, people complain, okay, I know TV, I don't work in TV, but I know that it's very hard to find TV producers. And on LinkedIn, I'll bluntly say pay more. Yeah. Um, it just yeah. seems like the media hasn't really, I mean, some people do make good money. But that's the big reason I moved to corporate is because, I mean, at the time, I think I was making $17,000 a year at a small Wisconsin newspaper and they were offering me $27,000 a year. And I was like, well, all right, you know, plus benefits and a 401k and, you know, matching. So, I mean, yeah. But when, um, when they offered you, so basically a long time ago when the media was really the place to get information, they didn't necessarily pay better than now when it's not. Okay. No, definitely not. Hmm. And when you went to corporate, cause I'm interested in corporate because um, it seems like, it seems like uh, when you work in media, it's transferable to corporate. Oh, so absolutely. You, yeah. How is that? Well, I mean, I, I've worked for, I worked for two large insurance companies, Fortune 500 insurance companies, and they just need, because they hire a lot of people who are really good at the business aspect of their job, but they're not good at communications. They don't think who needs to know this. When do they need to know it? What's the best way to tell them? They're just focused on like, you know, coding their system or, you know, developing the new product. And if you can understand information, process it, share it, 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 that's what they need. They need someone to like kind of be the PR for them to whatever the audience is, whether it's employees or the general public and make people go, why should I care about this? And why is it cool? Um, So huge transferable skills. Yeah. Well, don't think of interning the company to. Well, especially if you, you know, I was working, but I'm sure this is true for little companies too. But if you've got thousands of people and you want them to go out and be ambassadors for your company in the community with their family, their friends, their neighbors, whatever, they need to understand what the community is doing. 
or what the company's doing. They need to understand why it's important and they need to like genuinely be excited about it on some level because you don't want them going out and complaining, you know, um, when people look, because when people are trying to decide, well, you know, should I buy insurance from that company or not? Then there's like, oh, well, there's Joe. And every time I see him, all he does is moan, you know, so, so you've got, you know, that's one reason. And number two, the more people understand the breadth of what the company's doing, the better they can do their individual jobs because they see where their piece fits into the larger corporate puzzle. So I always loved talking to employees because, you know, uh, they're such a vital audience for the company's success on so many different levels. And what were your deadlines like? Because you know how in media, the deadline's really tight. Well, for most of my jobs, you know, it was, there would be at least one new piece story or news story put on our corporate internet every day. So usually like, you know, by four in the afternoon, I had to have that ready to go. So it could be uploaded and go live like at 5 a.m. the next morning. Um, and I wasn't always the only one writing the stories. There were lots of other people writing them. And often I was doing like the final edit before it goes up where I'd go back to someone and say, well, can you define this? Like, nobody's going to know what that means. Or I think your story really starts here rather than where, you know, you started it. And I liked doing that too, because I, I I'm kind of an editor at heart and I really liked working with other writers and saying, okay, you know, what can we do about this? Well, how did you, when you first went into it, how did you know what to do, how to do that? Oh, I mean. It was a learning curve. I mean, because first I had to learn all about insurance, which I knew nothing about. Um, and then I had to, you know, so I was always going to meetings and like listening to employees talk and, and getting their feedback. You have to kind of at least, I think, be a bit visible in the company if you're going to be the employee communications person, because then people will come to you and say, well, did you know my area is doing this one cool thing? Or I work with this coworker and she does this amazing, you know, thing. And so because, you know, it's so big, I don't always know what's going on. So, uh, you know, you have to make relationships and get to know people. So they'll come to you and tell you like the cool stuff that they're doing. That does sound like a beat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that's the way I always looked at it. It's a beat. And how long were your stories? Your, where are the stories that you had to post every day? I mean, they varied, you know, I mean, people tended to read shorter things, but I, I wrote, I would say anywhere between like 500 and 1500 words, depending on, you know, what it was, the okay. topic. And what was it like to work? in this at the same place essentially for 30 years it sounds foreign to me <laughs> well i split it i was at two different insurance companies for about 15 years each um but even 15 and, years is a long time it is it is a long time you know but again i developed a lot of good relationships and then you know since it's a big company people are always coming and going and shifting to new jobs and i had different jobs i wasn't doing the exact same job for those years and so that kept it interesting enough so do you have any advice for lasting at a company so long I think you have to, you have to go in and this is going to sound weird, but you know, you like, especially coming from a journalism background, you know, I had my journalism values, which I really tried to stick with, you know, we're going to tell, we're going to tell what's true and we're going to be clear and we're going to give people more information than they need. And sometimes in corporate America, things move a lot slower or, you know, you have a story and it gets stuck at a VP level because they're concerned about something. And you're thinking, we need to tell people, we need to tell people. And they're like trying to like make a decision or worried about a point. So sometimes you have to like just step back and go, that's corporate life. Like if, if this were a newspaper, I'd publish it anyway, because, you know, people need to know. But, but in corporate, you're getting approvals from a lot of different people with a lot of different things driving them. And I never, never once were we like, you know, we're going to publish something that isn't true, but trying to figure out the best way to say it that would get approved was always interesting. So I think you have to like lose a little bit of your urgency if you're working in corporate communications, because there are going to be things out of your control that, you know, you just have to wait on other people to come through on. Although I did get good at like staying by people's desk, you know, what I call polite nagging, like, you know, hey, have you looked at that? You know, what's the problem? What do you need? <laughs> yeah. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you this other thing because you don't, it, it may be hard to answer. I'm just prefacing this, but it seems like okay, the impression I get of corporate, because also I've been exposed to some stuff, um, is it seems like it's not really a place to have a personality, quote unquote. Like you really have to, okay, am I correct? <laughs> when I started, I felt that way very much. So I felt like I was in a room full of men with gray suits and I stood out like a flaky person because. I, I just was not a man in a gray suit. I like color. I like things that are vibrant. Um, then as, as my career went on and in corporate dress codes changed and it got a little better, but I do think you do have to, at some point, you know, I always felt like if I was in a room full of corporate people, 
I, I stood out as being maybe a little flaky. And then when I would go to children's book conferences, I seemed a lot more buttoned up than some of the other people. So I always felt like I was sort of on that, like that line. Oh, but there, yeah, there definitely are times where I would be in meetings and I, you have to put your corporate face on. <laughs> okay. But when you say you're, why did you think you were flaky? Only because I, I, I wasn't maybe as staid as some of the other people in the room. And I, cause I was afraid they would think I was flaky because I was wearing an orange blazer and orange shoes and, you know, <laughs> um, and was maybe just a little more colorful than, than some of the other people. And I remember like I would occasionally make some jokes and they'd all just look at me, but then that got better over my career as I grew up and as things calmed down a little bit in, you know, and in, in, were a little more flexible in corporate culture. And then of course, you know, when the pandemic hit and everybody started working from home, it got a, a lot more calm. Like I remember one of our meetings, the CEO was zooming in from the laundry room in his house because that's where he could find some quiet. So you could see the washer in the background, you know, and that wow. was kind of funny. Yeah. So what do you think about the culture, the corporate culture before the pandemic and after? It's much, at least for my company, it was much looser after the pandemic, you know, because people were just like, they'd be on their porch or their, you know, their cat would walk across the screen during the middle of, of the video, or, you know, you've got kids yelling things in the background, <laughs> you know, it's just much more relaxed. And I think people realized, you know, we still can get the work done, even if, you know, we're not all at our desks looking maybe our, our polished professional best. So what do you think about that change? Because you were in corporate uh, life for so many years before the pandemic. Right. Um, I'm a big introvert, even though I can function as an extrovert. So I actually liked working from my house. I liked the, I, I mean, it, toward the end, toward the end of the shutdown, I was starting to really miss seeing people. I was getting tired of my own company, but I think it took me longer to get there than maybe some more naturally extroverted people. So um, if I were to go back, uh, I think it would be hard to suddenly start showing up at an office again now that I've experienced, you know, working on my own and being my own boss. Okay. I'm married to an introvert. I understand you people. Um, the pandemic <laughs> was like the best thing that could have happened to my husband. It's like, it's like the world, the universe said, okay, here is, oh, by the way, Scott Becker just made a comment. He loves your books. We'll talk about your books, but, um, but I mean, the thing is that it's almost like it said to all the introverts in the world, okay, this is your time. You don't have to deal with small talk, et cetera, et cetera. For people like me, it was, it was very hard. So it was funny. Look, I, I was seeing a therapist at the time and we had a video thing and he said, Oh, said, a lot of my clients are really struggling with the pandemic. How are you doing? And I'm like, I'm actually not, and you know, I mean, I don't want to get sick. I'm worried about people dying, but personally, like it was not initially like a really big problem for me. Um, you know, other than, you know, you spend all this time with your spouse because you're in the house and suddenly you realize, you know, they chew really loud and that's kind of annoying. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, it was all good. That's good. I, I envy that. Yeah, I wish I was introverted because, you know, now that you say you're introverted, I do have some questions about that because um, I wrote a blog post that it's actually an introvert's world. Mm -hmm. And um, I say this because I read the book Quiet. Have you read that yeah, book? Yeah, that's a great what book. think of that book? I liked it. Um, it I, I felt like it saw me, you know, um, I've always felt a little bit though, like being an introvert is a bit of a disadvantage. And so that's why I think I learned in some ways how to step outside of that when I need to. Um, but yeah, no, I loved the book. I thought it was helpful. It was shown a light on it. I just think extroverted tendencies get, get rewarded earlier on in life, like in school um, and in early stages of employments. And I had to learn how to like step out of that when I needed to because uh, I read that book and I don't know what world she was talking about because in most of my work in organizations I cannot say anything and actually if I say something or if I talk too much I get in major trouble so it seems like the extra oh, okay. the introverts are yeah. thriving because you have to sit okay. at a computer all the time but you don't find that no, I always found that that the people that talked more got more attention and got their ideas listened to more than the people who were thinking, thinking, thinking it would make one quiet comment that then just got like bulldozed over by some more chatty people. Are you talking about in meetings? Yeah, meetings. Okay, because in my work, um, I maybe because I didn't work at one place all the time, but I found that um, in order to get work done, you shouldn't say anything, especially as a writer or editor. You shouldn't say anything. You should just do the work. And as long as you are practically invisible, you'll be fine. But if you start to show your personality, you get in major trouble. That's interesting. 
you know, I, I found it differently, but I can see what you're saying too. You know, I can totally see it both ways. I wrote a blog post about it. And then also, um, when you said, oh, you were talking about, okay, I want to ask you another thing about the media versus corporate is when you, you know how in the media, I don't know if it was like this when you were working in it, but you know how it's really cutthroat um, or can be really, you know, you think things are fine and then things are upended by somebody who guns for you or something. Um, what Was corporate life like that or? I mean, it could be. I tried to stay out of that because my goal was never to like, you know, like, be a vice president and like, you know, claw my way up the corporate ladder, but, but definitely from watching it from a distance with other people, it can be, I mean, also it it can be supportive, but there's definitely like when there were like, this job was going to open and you kind of knew who the three main candidates were. There were a lot of like jockeying for position. Okay. So it's if, it's it's if people are ambitious. Yes. It's ambition. Yeah. Okay. So as long as you're just uh, fine with your place, (laughs) nobody bothers. That's interesting. Okay. (laughs) Because <laughs> I haven't really, I really, I haven't really talked to anybody in, in depth about the corporate scene. Because I, I talked to somebody today, and I was telling them about not the details, but I said sometimes it's like Mean Girls, and I said, "Is your business like that?" And um, he didn't really have much to say. Maybe he was just being diplomatic or something. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you you definitely have friends, but then there's people that you have to work with, especially in big companies where you know they wouldn't be your choice of who you'd hang out with given your own options, but you're on this project team together and you've got to make it work. Well, then when you were working in corporate, is that when you started writing kids books? You've only written kids yeah. books, right? Yeah, I, I, re- I write picture books for kids. Um, I started doing it. I had always from like, I wrote my first draft of a picture book when I was 19 and then got a rejection and didn't do anything for 20 years. And then when I was 39, I was like, okay, I still want to do this. The, the desire hasn't gone away. I'm smarter now. I'm more mature. So I'm going to really try. So I would spend my nights, like I'd go work my corporate job, come home, hang out with my kids, put them to bed. And then I would spend, you know, the evenings reading, writing, researching, working. And I probably did an additional 20 to 25 hours a week that way, because I really, I can be kind of tenacious. And when I decided I want to do something, I was going to put in the effort. I wasn't going to like be real half-hearted about it. Um, So yeah, I started when I was 39. I sold my book, first book, four years after that. And during those four years, I got 126 rejections because what I initially started working on, like, you know, it wasn't good. Like I had writing skills, but writing a fiction picture book is totally different than writing a news story or a feature story or a corporate memo. Um, And I had to learn, you know, all the stylistic differences. I just, it was like anything I had to master the skill. Well, how did you have the energy to have a full-time job and have a family (laughs) I, I just really wanted it, you know, and they always say, if you want something, you'll prioritize it. And I just, I, I knew that if I didn't try when I was like 85, I was going to look back at my life and be, that's what I regret not trying. So I just, I was very single-minded about it. I stopped watching TV, which I had usually done after the kids went to bed. My house got a lot messier. I didn't work out as much because something's got to give you, you can't, you can't just add extra hours into the day. So that's what gave for me. And I put all that time into, you know, trying to learn how to do this because I just really, really wanted to. I'd always loved children's books. I'd always loved picture books, even when I didn't have kids. Um, They're like perfect little masterpieces, I think. And so I just decided I was going to do it. And I was happier, you know, even though it was a lot of work, I was happier when I was putting that much time and energy into it. Yeah, because one thing I noticed is when you're working, when you're doing writing for other people, and then when you write your own thing, whether it's for the public or not, it's a different sensation. Did you find that too? Oh, absolutely. Like everything I was writing for my corporate job, I would write it and then it would get re- reviewed by anywhere from like four to 15 people, like lawyers and subject matter experts and vice presidents. And they'd all come back with their notes on it, which was fine, you know, but, but this, it was, I could do whatever I wanted. Um, and it, I was the only one who had to like it. Um, and I could be creative. I wasn't writing about like, you know, cloth covered extension cords and their fire risks. You know, I was writing stories to hopefully, you know, speak to parents and kids. Well, how come you didn't write for 20 years after that one rejection? Because I didn't, it wasn't because I got the rejection and was devastated, but my 19 year old self went, oh, well, I tried, you know, (laughs) and I just kind of went on. Um, And then when I was older, I'm like, that wasn't really trying. That was like one attempt. Um, And then I went and I can do better than that. Um, but I thought about it a lot. It was always in the back of my head that, you know, someday, but 
I think it takes you a while to to realize that someday doesn't come unless you commit to making it come. And so it was 39 when I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to commit to making it come. And I think there's some level of fear in that. Like if there's this thing you really want it, and you don't try, you can always tell yourself, well, I could have done it, you know, but if you really try and then you fail, then you've got to accept that, you know? And so I think there was some fear to get started, but once I got started, I just kept going. But you said you got a lot of rejection. How did you deal with that quote unquote failure? Um, Okay. This varies for every author because I know authors who are very successfully published who have told me they cry every time they get a rejection still. And, and you get a lot of rejections even after you have books sold. And I was never like that. I was just always like, I had, I had a spreadsheet and I'd have, here's the story. Here's who I sent it to on what date. And then here's when they got back to me. And it was like, decline, 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 decline. And I just always looked at it like, well, that story wasn't ready yet. So I would go back and work at it some more. You know, I always looked at it like as like a not yet kind of thing. Like, okay, well, I'm not ready yet. So I will work harder, read more, revise. Um, and that I think kept me sane. <laughs> That's a great attitude. How did you get such a great attitude? I've rarely met people who have such an attitude. Yeah, I just, I, and maybe I should credit my parents for this, but I've always felt like if I worked hard enough at something that I really wanted to do, it could probably happen. I mean, and, and I think that's my parents, you know, um, you know, and then also I've, I, I'm a person who like, there's lots of things I'm, I'm terrible at. Like I've always said, I've got a real narrow skill set, but it's deep. Like I'm good at the things I'm good at. And so I think part of it too was like, I wasn't trying to do something that I never could have succeeded at. Like if I decided I'm going to try to be a ballerina, like never, ever, no matter how much work I put into it. But I was going into an area where I felt confident that I had a base level of skills that would eventually, you know, get me to where I wanted to be. Well, do you think sports also helped you with that attitude? Yeah, I think sports did because, you know, losing is part of the game. And I actually think corporate America helped me too, because some people that start out that have never written or had someone look at their work, like the first time someone says, oh, I think you should do this. Like, like they're wounded, you know, like their feelings are like, they're deeply hurt. And I, you know, had years of, of, lawyers and vice presidents wanting to add all kinds of crud to the stories that I wrote that I didn't think should be there. And I, you know, so I was used to getting feedback. I was used to responding to that feedback. I was used to redoing it and sending it back. And I think that really helped here because you know, I get a rejection, like, okay, well, I can just, I can just modify, you know? Um, so I think that helped a lot. And how, when, back to the corporate stuff, when people were giving you feedback and you didn't agree with it, this is also in journalism, when you didn't agree yeah. with it, how did you deal with that? I mean, how did you convince them that you should do it? And same with even writing fiction. Well, I would try really hard to understand what their point was, like what led them to give me this note, okay? And then I would like try to say, how can I incorporate that into my story in a way that I feel good about, but still addresses their point, you know? Some people are like, oh, well, you know, they wrote this whole paragraph, so I just stuck it in there. And I'm like, no, you know, like this is when I was an editor. What are they trying to say? How can you weave it into the story in a natural way that still is going to meet their need? Um, and so now, now I still get feedback from editors. They know what they're doing more than the people in corporate America did about writing. But it's made me much more, it made me realize there's a lot of different ways you can tell the same story. And that if I work on it, I can find that way. Well, I always think that editors in publishing do know what they're doing because they're actually they in the marketplace. Yes. Yeah, so I much prefer getting feedback from editors in publishing versus the vice president of accounting at an insurance company, you know, who knows accounting, but doesn't know writing. So yeah, it's much better getting editorial feedback from a writer. So how, well, I'm skipping ahead, but how did you, you know how um, you wrote children's or you've written a uh, picture books for kids, but have you ever considered graphic novels now that they're more mainstream? Oh, graphic novels are the huge trend in publishing. And there are people who will write the words for a graphic novel while somebody else does the art. But in a lot of cases, the same person does both. And I am not a, a artist at all. So while I admire them, it's never been something that I've thought was like really up my skill set, you know? <laughs> well, when you, how did you first sell your first book? Okay. So you said you I had sold, like over a hundred rejections. And... Yeah. So I've been sending stories out to editors, mostly in New York, you know, for four years um, and getting rejections. And I would occasionally get some encouraging things like saying, we'd like to see something else you wrote. Um, but I had gotten to the point where I was like, maybe this just isn't going to work. You know, maybe, maybe it's not going to happen, but I was still writing and sending because it made me, I was happier when I was doing it. Um, 
And so I had written the story called Sophie Squash. It had gotten probably 15 to 20 rejections so far. And I had like multiple versions of it on my computer because I would go back and revise. Like I had a version with a happy ending. I had a version with like a not so happy ending. And I was running out of places to send it to, but I sent it to one one place where I had always loved the books this publisher produced, um, Schwartz and Wade. It was a division of Random House at the time. And um, eight months went by and it was on my spreadsheet, but I wasn't thinking about it. And then they just called and said, you know, you probably don't remember sending us the story. And I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> um, and they, they picked it up and it, I didn't have a literary agent at the time. So I had sent it in just randomly and they called that the slush pile. And so slush pile tend to stack up and then every now and then they'll let interns go through it and like look for anything. And an intern had pulled my story out of the slush pile, gave it to her boss, Ann Schwartz, and Anne had liked it and called me. And then that was kind of how it started. But it was sort of like a needle in a haystack thing because not a ton of stories get picked up from the slush, like very few. So I was lucky. And now I have an agent and I can avoid the slush pile. <laughs> that's great. That's that's really inspiring that yeah. that somebody looked through the slush pile, but it is needle in the haystack, but also they probably were convinced. Well, you know, you worked on your craft for so long, so they saw that effort. Yeah, you know, and I think I've talked to, to people whose job it is to go through the slush pile and they say you have to go in with like a sense of cautious optimism because there's so much stuff in there, according to them, that just is horribly written, you know, that just isn't ready. And I certainly sent my share of stuff in previously that wasn't. But, you know, you're looking for that one thing that catches you and and they're not like reading every manuscript from start to finish. They're like starting and, and if it's not great, they just set it aside. So you've got to kind of grab them early on and then keep it going. So how do you do that? Um, I, I think, like you said, it's, it's working on your craft and writing the best possible story that you can write. And then even when you think it's ready to submit, I would say don't submit it right away. Like show it to several other writers, listen to them, let it sit for a month on your computer, come back, look at it with fresh eyes and say, because like I'm working on something now where there have been a couple of times I've thought it's done but I've let it set and I've come back to it. And I'm like, oh, I could do this. And you can always find a way to make it better. So people get so excited. I wrote this and I want it published and they send it out and it's probably not ready. Well, because I'm thinking that now with so many, you know, there's so much uh, freedom with people being able to write and publish and send right. things out. How does somebody stick out from all of that, all the bad writing? It's 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 just skill. It's a glut. Um, and it's a glut. Yeah, it is. And But I do think, I mean, I, I, I read a lot. I read traditionally published books. I read self-published books. I read stuff on the internet and in good writing stands out, you know, um, even, even in books that are published, there's just such a, a level of competence um, and some of it's subjective, but good writing and good storytelling and a unique approach really, really stand out. Um, and, you know, that's something you've just got to work hard at and then get a little lucky. Um, some of my more, most sorry most successful books lined up with something going on in the world, which I couldn't have predicted. You know, like my book, Be Kind, it, it came out at a time when school bullying was a problem. And, and a lot of schools were like, we really have to do something about it. I, and I couldn't have planned that because, you know, you write the book and then it goes off to the illustrator, which takes like two years for the art. And then it comes out. And so like there's a big gap between idea and and when it's on the shelf. So you don't know what's going to be happening in the world. So sometimes it's like this confluence of like your book just hits at the right time. And yeah, it still has true. to be good, but there's a, a element of chance in the whole thing too. But I, I think books that are published by publishing houses, I think they're really good because you've got the the agent, got, you've got the author, the agent and the editor. So by the yeah, time- There's a it's lot out, of gates you have to get through where, where people are like, how can we make this better? So absolutely, yes. Yeah. So I'm just, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's a writer's dream because you have an agent and then you also have editors and you might get rejected, but you, yeah. you publish 20 books, right? Right. Right. Um, and it goes in cycles. Like I've got 20 books out, I've got more coming out, but I still get re rejections routinely, you know, um, even from editors I've worked with and had successful books with, because what I wrote, it just doesn't hit them right. Or it's too similar to something they just signed up from somebody else. Um, and you just, you just keep going. I mean, that's all you can do is keep going. And then what was your first book? Um, Your first book got sold. And what was the angle that made it attractive? Oops, my background is oh, Sophie, Sophie Squash. Squash. Yeah. Um, 
it, in the, it, it's a quirky little book. It's based on something my youngest daughter did when she was a kid. We were in the grocery store and we were shopping and I put a butternut squash in the cart and we were co- going to check out and she was holding it and rocking it like it was a baby because you know, it's kind of shaped like a, a little person, if you think about it. And we took it home. She put a face on it and she carried it everywhere. And um, in real life, what happened was when the squash started to rot, I threw it away and bought her a new one. And she was perfectly fine with that. And I started thinking maybe there's a story here, but but the ending wouldn't work, you know? So I started thinking, what if I had let her keep the squash that she loved, even when it was starting to rot and get mushy, what might've happened? And so Sophie in the book has a squash, carries it everywhere, you know, is very proud of it, doesn't care what anybody else thinks. And then it gets mushy and gross. And she asks a farmer, you know, what can I do to keep my squash healthy? And he says, you need fresh air, good, clean dirt, and a little love. And so she interprets that to mean she should bury it in the garden. So she does. And then, of course, it snows. And as a Wisconsinite, that's what happens. And then in the spring, you have a new squash plant with baby squash, and the cycle just keeps continuing. So I, I kind of altered life to make it end the way I wanted it to. Um, my daughter's now 21, and she still says the parents in the book are, are nicer in real, than I was in real life. Yeah. Well, of course, kids are going to say that. Yeah, but, but I think it was, you know, it was the the quirkiness of carrying produce around and, and you know, falling in love with it. But it also sounds like it's working on different levels because you've got the philosophical aspect and the story itself. So are you always working on different levels when you write? Yeah, because book? okay. picture books are short. Like most of them are under a thousand words. A lot of them are 300 or 500 words, but there's layers. You've got the story. You've got the emotional heart of it. How does it make you feel? It's got, you know, the more layers you can have in a very short story, it hits you on different levels. And that's what I think gives the book staying power and makes you want to read it again, which is important for picture books. Um, so yeah, and that's, it's really hard. I would say it's like doing verbal Sudoku. You've got to have everything all lined up and it has to work on every single level. And if one of them's off, you know, it's not going to work until you fix it. Well, do you start with your theme or what do you start with? Um, usually I start with a couple words or a couple phrases. And a lot of times I'll like hear pe- part of people's conversation and I'll just hear a couple words and I'll be like, I can use that. But then I also think, how do I want the reader to feel when they've finished reading the book? And I'll jot down a couple words and stick them on a post-it note. And that really helps when you're trying to focus, like half of a picture book's success is what goes in and what doesn't. So if I know how I want them to feel, that helps me figure out what do I put into the story and what do I leave out? It like guides what I'm doing. Um, So that's been really important part of my process. So what what are some examples of how you want people to feel? Uh, Hopeful, inspired. Um, safe. Safety comes up a lot in my books. I want kids to feel safe, even if maybe they don't in real life. I want them to feel safe when they read that book. Um, It really depends on the the book. Um, You know, they all have different themes, but um, confidence comes up a lot. And then when you, when you first started writing these books, did you think about all these things or just happened as you, okay. (laughs) I was, you know, I was just trying to tell a story but then, you know, the more I got into it and I saw what was selling and what wasn't, I mean, you just get smarter and more, you know, you just get smarter about it. And I started realizing I was doing things in a certain way and it was, was working. And then I started looking at like other people's books and not just reading them for fun, but going, oh, like I see what they did there, you know? And I just became much more enthralled with the whole structure of, of a picture book. Um, so yeah, I, I, it's one of my favorite things to talk about, obviously. <laughs> You mean uh, what the the process or? Yeah, the whole process of how do you write a compelling yeah. picture book? How do you make it work? Yeah, yeah, because I think some people think, oh, there's this cute little story like, oh, girl found a yeah. butterfly, and this is what happens, and they think that's the point. But I think people it it's elevated. Like people can keep going back to a book again and again, and they see something different, and that's really good art. Yeah, exactly. You know? Um, and some people think, well, they're short, so they must just be really easy. But but my other thing is like you like if there's 300 words, say that's your goal, you want to have the right 300 words. You know, you could have a 300 word story, but maybe it's best told in 150 words. So I'm always going through going, what would happen if I took that sentence out? What would happen if I took that line out? How would it read? And if everything in the picture book has to make the story move forward, it's not like a a longer book where you can have a prologue and, you know, a digression about whatever, like, no, it's all got to make it move forward. And if it doesn't, you got to take it out. Um, and so I have this whole like online webinar that's free on YouTube 
called Cutting the Fluff. It's like 10 tips for going through your manuscript and taking out what you don't need. Um, but to me, that's where most beginning writers fail is there's way too much stuff in there. Well, and also, I think people, quote unquote, fail. This is what I've noticed because I've been in these writing groups and so forth. But it seems like people want the life of a writer. So, for instance, like they can see, you know, somebody like you or somebody, um, somebody else who they have a certain kind of lifestyle, like, oh, I'm writing a book and now I'm on vacation and I've got my agent. I'm going to go to New York and have lunch. And they see this kind of lifestyle. That's not and what that, it's like. <laughs> right. They, they don't know that it's like writing and rewriting and. Right. Meeting Sitting your at your goals. kitchen table surrounded by dirty laundry and unwashed dishes going, why can't I get this sentence right? I mean, you know, sure, there are some parts of it that look really good on Facebook and Instagram. Like if you go to a book festival and you're speaking or you're at a bookstore and there's a lot of people there to see you. But then there's the day in and the, the day out, you know, where you're unshowered at your computer, like agonizing over why it's not working or you thought you got it. And then you get like eight rejections. I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> It's definitely uh, an interesting. Yeah. So what keeps you reality. grinding? What keeps you going through the grind? Because I know for the creative process is very special. Yeah. But then there's uh, that other part. Yeah. I think what keeps me going is one, I just love to write. I'm so much happier when I'm writing and revising just personally. I, I love it. Um, I think some people start out because they think, well, I'll write this book and it'll be a bestseller and that'll be awesome. But but do you really like to write? You know? Yeah. Um, so for me, I love what I'm doing. Two is... I just, I think back to when I was a kid and what were the books that would have helped me? Like, what was I worried about? What was I scared of? What would have helped me? And I like putting that out into the world. And then you sometimes, if you're lucky, hear from parents and kids where that book hit the way you wanted it to and made a difference. And that's very fulfilling. And also, you know, a lot of the world really stinks right now. There's a lot of horrible things happening out there. And I'm like most people thinking, what can I do to make my little corner of the world better and sometimes it feels like there's not a lot but thinking I can tell these stories like so, several of my books have been written because I felt really strongly about something happening in the world and I'm like what can I do in my own small way to combat that I've got a book called not so small that's I call it my protest picture book it's about finding your voice and speaking up um, I have one that just sold um, that have, probably won't come out until 25 or 26 that's all about how we're more alike than we think we are. And so I'm, you know, a lot of that inspires me too, is what can I put into the world that maybe will make it a little better of a place? Yeah. I feel when you're talking, I feel the emotion and it's very moving, you know, what you're talking about. Um, because I can tell you're very sincere about your pursuit um, and you want to help people. Yeah. People think that, you know, helping people is just physically doing something, but what, what's been the reaction from your readers? for all your books. Well, I mean, I've, I've heard some wonderful stories like for Sophie Squash, you know, I've, I've heard from, I've gotten tons of pictures of kids carrying their own vegetable around a squash and eggplant or watermelon, whatever. But then I, I, you know, you get things you don't expect. Like I've heard from several people where they have an elderly parent or grandparent who's in like dementia care and they've read them Sophie Squash and it's really resonated with them on some level, you know, and I've heard that enough times where I'm like, I don't know why that's the case, but it's kind of awesome to hear. I have a book called When You Are Brave. And I've heard from a lot of people saying, I bought this for my kid because we're starting swimming lessons and they're scared or they're worried about this. And they're like, and I read it and I realized it was a book I needed to hear as an adult. So I just try to like write for like the kid, but then also that an older reader could get something out of it too. And I love it when that happens, you know, or be kind. I'm, a lot of schools use it. And I've heard from teachers, you know, in, in what their kids have said or changes they've seen in their kids' behavior after they read the book. Um, and I love all of that. And so when you, when you say that uh, be kind is in a lot of schools, are you talking about nationwide? Yeah. Oh, nationwide. Yeah. It's, I mean, that was the one that made the New York Times bestseller list and has sold, I think, well, over 300,000 copies. And it's in a ton of schools. And a lot of schools have used it as their like school-wide read where everybody in school reads it and then they like they make lists like what are kind things I did what are kind things I could do what's something kind someone did for me and they either like post them on posters or they make huge paper chains or they, they do all kinds of things to like you know track the acts of kindness um and then I get cool pictures <laughs> well do, then do they ask you to come and speak there or not um sometimes I've done some video things with schools I've, I've gone into some schools I don't do a ton of school visits but I mean if they ask me and I can you know I, I come um 
I do charge because it's like, you know, travel and time off that I could be writing. But but yeah, I do do school visits. So does your agent also handle that or is your agent? No, I handle that. Actually, I work with a separate school visit booking agency. It's called school. It's called I should know what it's called. School visit dot connector. And um, it's on my website. They contact them, they contact me and then they handle all the contractual stuff. um, And then I just come and speak. Wow. And yeah, so it does sound like you're living the author's dream. I mean, you know, to write something. Well, when you wrote that book, you know, your your successful book, did you think it was going to be so big? No, I had two books coming out that year. And I remember I thought, I wonder which one's going to do better. It was Be Kind and a book called Wide Awake Bear. And one is a bedtime story. And one is, you know, about how can you be kind to other people? And I was like, I don't know. And, you know, and Be Kind just like took off. And I mean, you can't predict it. You know, you just can't predict it. Well, how um, did it take off? Well, you know, usually if books make the New York Times bestseller list, they make it the week they're released. But that's just the way it normally works. Well, my book came out in March, you know, wasn't on any lists, but I think it was a word of mouth thing. I think teachers started like in groups and stuff saying, hey, I use this with my class, you know, and then it just like word of mouth started building. And in August, it was on the New York Times list for like 10 consecutive weeks. It just, you know, it just. And then once it was on there, more people knew about it. And it just kind of like built. Well, you know, when um, when it was first published, did the publisher do a lot of promotion and marketing? They did quite a bit of promotion and marketing. Um, the editor told me later that she had pushed for more and, and, and didn't get it. But they did, you know, because it's just it varies how much you get from the publisher for books. But they did a, a decent amount. And then once it started doing more, they they upped it after that, too. And I always do. I mean, since I did work in communications, I have a a decent understanding of promotion. And so I always do my own set of promotion for books. But I did the same thing for Be Kind and Wide Awake Bear. And, you know, one took off and one didn't as much. Yeah, because I was asking, you know, do you think it's important? Like how much promotion do you think is important for a book? Or is it a combination of the, the, the culture, the promotion, word of mouth? What do you think? It's a combination. And then there's some intangibles that are out of your control. But I always feel it's my responsibility as an author to, you know, hold up my end of it. Um, and so like, I, I like social media. Some people don't, I happen to like it. So I do quite a bit on social media. I have a mailing list. I send out postcards to people and I'm always updating it and maintaining it. And yeah, you know, I did that all myself. Um, and then, you know, interviews, blogs, whatever. Um, but yeah, I try to hold up my end of things. So what kind of, what do you send the postcards out about? Just saying I've got a new book out, you know, it'll have the the cover and the the blurb about what it's about and here's how you can order it. And here's when it releases. Um, and it's basically like anyone I've ever said hi to in my life you know, is on that list. So. And so how come you decided to do that snail mail kind of thing? Um, you know, it's, this might sound dorky. I like the act of addressing the postcards because it lets me think fondly about like whoever I'm sending it to. Um, I think maybe it's a little less likely to get lost than if it was an email, you know, which is easy just to go delete, delete, delete. Um, I I mean, I was, I do it because it makes me feel good. And I don't, you know, it's hard to say, I, there's no way I can say, and by doing that, I saw sales go up X percent because there's no, there's no way to prove that. Um, but I like doing it. So I do. So what kind of social media do you like? Um, well, I was a huge Twitter fan and I still like Twitter, even though it's changing. Um, but I, I just like saying funny things or interesting things in a short you know, amount of, of space. Um, I use Instagram. I use LinkedIn. I use Facebook. I should be using TikTok, but it's just right now, it's just one thing too many. <laughs> um, yeah, because there are a lot, a lot of young people on TikTok. Oh, yeah. And book talk is a thing like where people talk about books on TikTok and they take off. I just I probably need to like get a college student and be like, can you help me with my TikTok account? Yeah. I mean, also, it's what, what you're comfortable with, because obviously you're successful. Right. So whatever you've been yeah, doing, you can't do working. everything. You just can't, you know. Um, so at this point, no TikTok. <laughs> OK, so um, you've written several books, but in every book, have you thought about how the kid is going to receive it and the adult? Yes. Now, was that, did you think about that before you launched, uh, uh, pursued this kind of thing? No, early on, I wasn't thinking about that at all. I was just trying to tell a story. But then the more I got into it, the more I realized, because, you know, the books are for kids and they're always the primary audience. But for picture books, it's the adult buying it. You know, a kid's not like, I've got 20 bucks. Let me go, you know, buy this book. So you've got to have something that appeals to the adult buyer and the kid listener, you know? Um, And plus, I think good stories do have that, like, 
elements of emotional truth where whether you're three or 103 and three, you can be like, I felt that way. I've had a moment like that in my life where you go, oh, so I try to get that in there as, as much as I can, because that just makes it much more relatable. Yeah, it reminds me of this is a strange comparison, but it reminds me of Bugs Bunny because yeah. I would watch those cartoons. I think, oh my gosh, they're actually like, sometimes I'll watch a cartoon and I'll think they're working on different levels here because they're working to entertain the kids, but they're also working to entertain the adults or in the art, they'll have some details that are really. Right. So adults are laughing in one spot and kids are laughing in another, you know, and I don't think one takes away from the other. They kind of just all work together. Now, did you think that you're going to have so many books? Did you have that many ideas? You know, I was just initially hoping to get my first one out. I mean, you know, but then you get your first one and you're like, okay, but I could do this and this and this. Um, I'm, I never worry about running out of ideas. Um, I worry a little like, will people get tired of, of what I'm putting out or will the market change and maybe I won't be able to adjust. Um, but I don't worry about running out of ideas. But it seems like, I mean, is there really a style of market? For children's well, books. I mean, you know, the picture book market has changed over the years. I mean, books have gotten substantially shorter than they were. If you look back at like some of the ones out in the 40s and the 60s or the classics, they're a lot longer, like the Velveteen Rabbit. I mean, that's not something you generally read your kids before bed anymore because it's beautiful, but it just goes on and on and on. And now they're much more punchy. Um, so that changes. And then, you know, like graphic novels have gotten really big. And then there's trends, you know, like you'll have a lot of dinosaur books and then a lot of pirate books. And like a couple of years ago, there were just a ton of picture books all about trees all at the same time. And you're like, why, you know? So it's, it's hard to know what's going to happen. But I mean, it sounds like, it sounds like people are successful despite what the market trends are because you have your, like, do you have a style? Like what is your style or what is your, what makes you, you, you know what I mean? As an author. That is a really, hmm. Hmm. I I think, I think it's the way I put words together. I have a voice that, that is identifiable in in some ways. Um, And I think I'm kind of known for social and emotional learning picture books, picture books that have like, like that emotional component to them, which I didn't set out to do. It's just sort of the way it went. You know, I've got books about kindness and strength and bravery and self-confidence and, you know, all those kind of things. So I guess that's probably it. Um, I'm probably the most proud of, of my writing voice, though. I, I really worked hard on that. Okay, so how do you describe your writing voice? You know, that's a, another really good question. I, I read everything I write out loud because picture books are supposed to be read out loud. So I'll spend a lot of time reading it out loud and going, how does that sound? And how do these two words sound next to each other? Like, is there a repeating internal vowel sound that makes, like, just today I had, um, if think of the example I had, I had used the word train. I want to train my cat too. But then when I read it out loud, I realized trained didn't sound right. So I changed it to teach. And they're these like little tiny yeah. things just to make it sound better when it's read out loud. And so I like to think that when I'm done and my book's out there, it, it has like a really good flow, you know, where anybody, even because people have all different levels of reading proficiency. I've heard people read picture books out loud and it's been painful listening to them, you know, but my goal is always that anybody could pick this up. And if I've done my job well enough, they're going to have an easy time reading it out loud, you know, not because the words are simple, but because they're the exact right word paired next to the the other one. Well, that's the art and that's like poetry and that's like yeah, fine exactly. writing and that's like music. Yeah. I think picture books are poetry in, in many ways, whether they rhyme or not. I mean, they're like, they're lyrical and, and, and I really enjoy that aspect of it. Yeah, because there are certain cultures that have been writing for like, let's say a thousand years and they developed a lyrical ass, you know, they developed a lyrical style to actually match their language as well. And it's in their culture. But I think people don't really think about that because they're just receiving it. Exactly. Yeah. But another thing, okay, this is another thing is when you write these books about these topics, how do you avoid being preachy? Like, you know how, Mm -hmm. like, I feel like with (laughs) art, whether it's visual or reading, I think that the reader and the the viewer should finish it to uh, create their own conclusions. Yes. How do you write in that way to, or I, I'm assuming you are They should not be preachy. They should not. 
so like when I wrote Be Kind, I really struggled with that because the, the title is like a command, right? And I didn't want the book to be, you should do this, you should do this, you should do that, because nobody wants to be told what to do, whether you're a kid or an adult. So I wrote the book in first person. So you're inside the head of the main character. And the main character, there's a classmate is having a bad day. And the kid's thinking like, well, what could I do to help? And the first thing they tried doesn't work the way they hoped it would. The, they actually end up kind of like making the other kid feel worse. And so they're thinking in the book, it says, well, maybe I could have done this. Maybe I could have done that. So as a reader, you're in the main character's head going through a list of options, you know? And so instead of being do this, it's you're kind of invited into helping answer the question. And then at one point the, the main character said, you know, well, what does it mean to be kind anyway? And I know a lot of schools like get the kids answering that question. So I tried to like bring them in and help them think it through without telling them what to do. Or I have another book um, called Remarkably You that's all about finding what makes you special and celebrating it. And it's all, you might be this, you might be that, you might be this. And then the kid can like self-select into like where they think that they fit. And so I spend a lot of time on that. And even if, if you do feel like you have to put in a lesson or a moral, you know, the times I've done that, it's been like, six words like in my brave book there's a line that says some days are full of things you'd rather not do mm. and that's I mean it's just it's the universal truth but it's short you know and then yeah I, I if you find yourself saying and that's why you should always do x you know no, that's that's not the right approach. No, it's an essay it's an essay yeah yeah and that's not it's you're always telling a story and then the reader should draw the conclusion if you told the story well enough not you know you banging them over the head with it yeah, because that's sort of like visual art too. Like sometimes I'll see conceptual art. I'm like, wow, man, this is so obvious. This is, I'm, I feel like I'm reading a treatise, you know, when I yeah. see some stuff. No. But with the um, with the messages though, how do you, okay, when, when you first write it, do you write it more, um, Do you, are you more upfront with the message and then you change your writing as you go on to make it more showing or? I've gotten much better at not having the message in early on. I, I might have it in the back of my mind. Sometimes I read a whole draft and then as I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, this is what the message is. And then I adjust from there, but I've gotten much better at not putting that in early on. Well, when you write, are you thinking about the images or are you just thinking about the words? Okay. And this varies again. I know writers that see the whole book in their head, like a movie. I, my brain is weird. I see no pictures when I write. I just see the words on the page, but I think I'm in a minority um, on that from other writers that I've talked to. Well, do you write like in a big blob or do you set, do you cut down the pages? Like I'm going to write on this page and this page and this page. Well, I have a word document and I, I don't mark the pages. Like this is the first spread. This is the second spread, but I do paragraph breaks where I think there ought to be a pause or I'm moving into something different. But a lot of my picture books, when you look at the word document, they look like a poem. It's a, a series of like very short lines. Sometimes it's just one word on a line. Um, and I think a lot of people think, you know, if you're writing a thing, it's got to be like big blocks of text. But for a picture book, a lot of times, if you take your favorite and you type it out, it looks like a poem. Now, have you ever considered uh, writing just a book, no pictures? Um, like why no. a picture book? Okay. Well, I mean, I just, I think picture books are awesome because like I do everything I can to tell the best story I can in this limited space. And I leave a lot of detail out. Like I try to avoid adjectives. I just try to keep it very open. And, and for two reasons. One is, like I said before, I want as many readers as possible to find themselves in the story. And if I'm being very specific, like, you know, and we're in like the front yard of a red house with a porch, you know, if, if you live in on a farm in Nebraska, or if you live in the middle of New York City in a tiny apartment, you can say that's not me, right? right. So I try to like, leave open points but also I know the illustrator is going to draw the art and fill in all kinds of detail um and so I try to leave a lot of room for them to do their job and not be like overly specific about it yeah because I'm just wondering how you write something well do you always know who's going to illustrate I, when I start writing I never know who's going to illustrate it um the publisher buys the book and then they match me up with an illustrator so when I'm writing no idea so you're writing are you right? Because I'm just wondering how people leave the room for the illustrator. Like you were just saying, you know, maybe they'll um, uh, they'll draw something that's more universal. So, how are you focusing just on the words without even considering 
what might be visual? Well, I, I figure like when I'm writing the story, the illustrator isn't looking over my shoulder going, don't you need a comma there? Or shouldn't the character be doing this? So I'm just telling the best story I can. And then I'm very comfortable with handing it off to them to do whatever they want with the art. And like, again, very few adjectives. Like I write a lot in first person. And so a lot of times if you're reading the story, I never say, is the character a boy? Is it a girl? Is it someone who's non-binary? You know, it's just not in there. Um, and then that gives the illustrator this free reign to like create whatever they want. Oh yeah, I was gonna ask you that. Um, first person, second person, third person. You said I you wrote, wrote in all of them. <laughs> okay, so I, what's I like the difference? Like, what's the crit? Yeah, what do you feel like the difference is? Well, I, I've been leaning more toward first person because again, you're in the character's head. It it it, it lets every reader think this could be me. Um, so I really like that, especially when the book is about feelings. Um, some stories, the third person, when you've got a really strong character like Sophie and Sophie Squash, or I have some books I co-wrote with E.E. E. Charlton Trujillo called Lupe Lopez. Lupe is like one of those characters that leaps off the page. When you've got a character like that, third person works better because you, you can say more about them because like they are who they are. Um, and second person works well when you're trying to like pull the reader in, like, you know, maybe you this, maybe you that. Um, so it just depends. And, and there's times I've written stories in all three, the same story and said, which one works better? Cause like, I, I didn't really know. So I've tried it all ways and then picked the one that was most effective. And it wasn't like, um, this, cause I personally like third person, I mean, writing, but what's it like to write? What's the sensation when you're writing a third person, second person or first person? Do you feel like it's more intense first person? It's a little more intense first person. But I'm always just trying to like, what is the best fit for that story? Okay. You know, some stories wouldn't work in first or second person and they're much better in third. So it's just, it's finding the right fit for that story and then doing the best job that you can. Now, have you ever uh, tried to um, create these for TV or anything or streaming or anything? Uh -huh. I'd love to, but usually what happens is like it sells to the publisher. And then if someone would want to turn it into like an animation or a movie, they would contact the publisher and, and, my agent would get involved and that hasn't happened yet. I've had things turned into audio. I've had them turned into like little mini like cartoons for schools. Um, I've had them translated into foreign languages, but but no like TV or movie yet. So what's it like to see it in different uh, media? It's, it's awesome. Like I especially love when like, they do the audio version and they hire like an actor to read it. Just listening to how a professional reads the book and what they emphasize and the voices that they use. Um, that's pretty awesome. And then what's it like to see, um, these shorts, you know, based yeah, on the shorts are cool. They usually use the art from the book, you know, and, and then they make it move somehow. Um, and then they again have a, a professional, like reading the story. That's kind of cool. This, and then they have like, they add music, you know, and like, so it swells at like, you know, normal or, or big important times in the story. So when, when you started your whole pursuit of uh, creative writing, you know, fiction writing, did you think it was going to become like this? Like, what did you think? <laughs> I just figured I would get a book out there and hopefully it would do well. And I would be really happy to go to a library and see it on the shelf or see it in a bookstore. And, and once I had a couple of books out, I started thinking it would be like so cool if someday I could do this full time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I had eight or nine books out before I even started thinking about doing it full time because, you know, you don't make, I mean, unless you write the Hunger Games or Harry Potter you know, you don't make, a, and, you, and with picture books, you're splitting money with the illustrator because they told half the story. Um, so it just took a while to get to a point where I'm like, I can still pay my bills mm -hmm. if I do this full time, you know, and then health insurance, you know, I was providing health insurance with my corporate job and that's kind of important. Um, so it, it's hard to get to a point where like, this is just what I do. Well, when so you're I'm working, at, <laughs> right, that's great. When you're, when you're working at your day job, when you're working at your day job, because, you know, that's why I call it if somebody's doing something creative. Yeah. Um, did you sometimes uh, like think about what you were doing creatively while you're doing your other job? Or OK, I normally tried very hard to keep them separate because I didn't want my day job to be like, you know, you're not really here. I mean, you know, I, I didn't want to do things on corporate time. But but there were times I'd be like in a, a meeting and somebody would say something and I'd be like huh and in my head I would be you know like spinning something or I, I'd write myself a note you know so I wouldn't forget it and take it home with me <laughs> the only time I did book work on corporate time was when the company I worked for was going through a huge reorganization 
And, you know, you all had to reapply for your jobs and, and the org chart had shifted. And I'd gone through this multiple times in my career and I, you know, always ended up with a box. Well, this time the job I had did not exist on the new org chart, but there was a similar one. So I applied for it and I didn't get it. And, you know, that stinks. I mean, I was like, 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 what am I going to do? You know, um, cause I wasn't at a point where I thought I could just write full time. And there were more jobs that were going to be coming that I could apply for, but they weren't posted yet. And so everybody who hadn't gotten a job in the first round was sort of in like corporate purgatory. We were in temporary desks in a temporary location with not much to do. And I was pissed off, you know? Well, that must be (laughs) very hard to deal with. Oh, it was awful. And so I was sitting there and I thought, I need a pep talk. So I, on corporate time, I started writing myself a pep talk in a Word document because I didn't have anything to do. And I looked at it and I thought, this could be a picture book because it was all about being brave. And I thought, you know, we ask kids to be brave all the time, you know, go do this. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And so then I started like turning it from a pep talk to me into a picture book. And so I did write that picture book on corporate time and I'm not there anymore. So too bad, (laughs) but that's the only like full thing I did on corporate time because I didn't have anything else to do. And I was annoyed, Um, but it became when you are brave and it's done really, really well. But sometimes I think that, you know, especially with creative people, when there are hardships, it makes people more creative. Yes. Yes. Okay. So what do you think? You have that that emotion in you. Yeah. Um, Not so small. I wrote right after the the 2016 presidential election when I wasn't happy with the results. Um, You know, so when things happen in life, they give you a lot of emotion. It's easier to put that out on the page, you know, and I think it comes across as more real. And I was going through the whole you know, job insecurity thing. And it's people relate to reality. And when you can put yourself on the page and maybe even a a vulnerable sort of way, I think people see themselves in that. Yeah. So now what do you think about people who are trying to deal with that hardship and then they're pouring their emotions out, but it's not selling like they create their, what do you think about that? Yeah. Well, I think sometimes, you know, you write things that are just for you. You know, I mean, sometimes you're going through some things that are so painful and writing it out helps you immensely, but maybe it's not meant for a larger audience, or maybe it would require a lot of work. Like I have a, um, a writer friend who, when I first knew her, had written a draft of a memoir all about her less than perfect childhood. Um, and, you know, she worked on it and worked on it and worked on it and submitted it and it just didn't get the interest but it was beneficial for her to do that. And then years later, she was able to turn it into a fictional middle grade novel. It was inspired by her childhood and the memoir, but it was a total like magical realism middle grade. It's called Coyote Queen. It's by Jessica Vitalis. It just came out. It's awesome. But it took her that many years and a couple different attempts to take the pain from her childhood and turn it into something, you know, that was going to work in the, the children's lit market. Yeah, because sometimes you have to elevate. Sometimes you have these personal experiences and then you have to elevate it for others to bring others into it. Yes, or or maybe make it a little more universal because some of the yeah. horrible stuff that happens to us is so incredibly specific that right. you know you might have to broaden it a little bit, you know, if your goal is to have a, a wider audience. That's true. But you know, I just made a note about this. You talked about friends. Have your friends changed because now that you're uh, published? Are you in with the other authors? What's going on with that? Well, you do, you know, the, the children's lit world is is kind of small when you think about it. And so I tend to meet the same people if I'm at a conference or I'm at a book festival or whatever. Um, so yeah, I now have a, a, a friend group of, of published authors, which is really great because then if something's not working, I can send it to them and say, what do you think? Um, but I'm still also friends with a lot of people I was in writing groups with, you know, early on that may or may not have published works of their own. So it wasn't like, you know, it more, my friend group more got added on to than totally shifted. So what's it like to actually have a huge audience and these published authors, you go to conferences, what's that like the lifestyle? It's because it's cool. different. I mean, it really is. Cause a lot of times you meet people that I've only read their books and, you know, and, and I always say like a really good picture book is when I want to hug. And so like, maybe I'll have read books by someone that I just adore. And then you see them at a conference. And I mean, I kind of become a fangirl. I'm like, oh my God, that's Marla Frazee. Or that's, you know, that's so-and-so. Um, and I've had people react that way to me, which I think is hilarious because I'm just an average middle-aged Midwestern woman, you know, so it always, but in this little niche area, I'm well-known, you know? So when I'm, when I get that reaction, I always find it amusing, but then I react that way to other people who are just normal everyday people, but they wrote something really cool. 
Yeah, you mentioned Midwest. What do you think that the, I mean, I'm from the Midwest too, but yeah. do you think the Midwest is different than other areas of the country? <laughs> well, you know, they always say there's that Midwest nice concept, which I always laughed at, but then <laughs> I've been on like like phone calls with New York editors or New York marketing people. And several of them have told my agent, she's just so nice. So like wow. maybe Midwest nice, like is a thing. I don't know. <laughs> but what about also the work ethic, the, oh. the being down to earth, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, I, since I've never lived in other parts of the country, I've just visited, I, I don't know for sure, but like my, my dad was all about the work ethic. You know, you got up and you, you did what you were supposed to do and you did it well and you put in the effort um, and so, yeah, I was definitely raised, didn't matter if you liked the job or not. It was like what was in front of you and it was what you were supposed to do. So that I think was very much ingrained in me. Um, so I, I definitely think that the Midwest has its own kind of like vibe. Hmm. Yeah. People, you must get a lot of questions about Wisconsin, right? Yeah. And the thing that never even occurred to me was like in Sophie's squash, I mentioned how the snow fell and then the, the squash stayed underground until it's better the next winter. I heard from people, you know, going like, well, like, where does the snow stay on the ground all winter? And I'm thinking to myself, well, everywhere. And then I'm like, well, duh, not if you live in Arizona. But it just, that was so much part of my life that I didn't stop to think when I wrote it, that there's lots of places where that just would not be the case. Yeah. There are people who come to the Midwest and they're like, wow, it's snowing. And then and they're excited when there's on a the blizzard. Ground. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's something else you mentioned too, that made a note about, um, Okay, you talk about how sometimes adults will be affected by your books, by the themes. Now, one thing I've noticed again and again with kids' books is they talk about be who you are, da da da. But then when you grow up, you can't be. Okay, what do you think about that? I think the more we can encourage kids to be who they are when they're young, hopefully it will stay with them when they hit that point where they feel like they've got to like massively conform. Um, you know, and one of one of the Lupe Lopez books, it's called Lupe Lopez Rockstar Rules, is about this girl that goes to kindergarten and, and she is going to be a rock star drummer. Like she knows who she is. And then she runs into all the school rules that want her to like dull or shine, you know, like use your inside voice and, you know, all of that. And it's, it's the whole book is her realism. How do I balance that? How do I still be me? But yet get along in school and she figures out a way to do it. And so hopefully like the books can help kids like hit that balance because I found that when you get older it actually works against you and you're and people are not necessarily doing anything offensive it's more like there's I don't know if you notice this but it, there seems to be an intolerance towards what people are supposedly preaching yeah I think yourself. there's definitely yeah it's like that corporate face thing when you're in a meeting you have to put on your corporate face and just you know like like, like fit the mold and uh I, I guess I'm hoping my books will maybe make that not as common, which is probably a very lofty goal. Well, especially when famous rich people say it, it's like, well, yeah, you're yeah. famous and rich. So, right. you know, it works for you. Or Bill Gates, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> right. Okay. So anything else? I don't know. I think that's good. Okay. Cause uh, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think I've asked you everything. It's very interesting and how you've done all these things, but where do you see yourself in five years? Do people used to ask you that in, in, in a job? Yeah. Interviews? Yeah. Um, I, I, hopefully I'm still writing books. Hopefully they're still coming out and doing well. Um, and I have thought about maybe, you know, writing something for slightly older readers, which scares me a little bit, but maybe in five years I'll have done that. Yeah. Because there is an issue with, I don't know if you've noticed this, but I really think there's an issue with age discrimination. And I think people are uh, struggling with that, but they don't feel like people are talking to them about it in the culture. So I don't know. Have you ever considered that, that concept? I mean, are you talking about like for adults or for? For adults. Yeah. I mean, if I wrote something for slightly older people, it would probably be like, you know, middle schoolers. Um, oh, I don't ever see myself. Yeah. I don't ever see myself writing an adult novel, although I love them and respect them and they're amazing. But um but but when, with the age discrimination thing, I do worry about that a little bit. Like as I get older, you know, am I still going to be relevant or because it does seem sometimes that the, the book world revolves around the cool new authors, you know, the, yeah. the hip, much more photogenic people than me. Um, and so sometimes I, I worry about that. Like, am I just going to kind of get ignored as I get older and grayer and, you know, whatever. Um, but then I, I just like, well, all I can do is write the best thing I can write. Um and I'm so I'm going to keep doing that and just see what happens. 
Okay, no, so you're saying a little older because you know it's funny because I don't um I obviously don't um uh, write or read uh kids' books, but I mean I've read you know, I, I got um I got certified to teach elementary school, so I read some stuff. But what I'm thinking about when you said older, I thought literally an adult. Um YA, that's really hot. Yes. It okay. Is. Do you it read is. YA? I read I do. YA. I love, I love YA. I love, yeah. I love, especially like, you know, I mean, there's all different kinds of YA, but I love the the modern contemporary, like set in real time, current day kid in a high school solving a problem. You know, I just, I, I just, it takes me right back to when I was in high school. Cause some of the, the issues are just so universal, you know, do I fit in, you know, who am I, how do I get along? I mean, it just, they're just like, these amazing universal issues, which is awesome to read about. And so you're thinking you're considering writing YA maybe? I have an idea for a possible book, but I've been saying that for years and I need to sit down and try to start like fleshing it out because I'm sort of scared of, of, cause it's so different than a picture book. It's so different. Um, but I think I need to try. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, any, so nothing else, right? <laughs> no, this is been <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, let me hold on a second. Okay. I'm going to stop this right now.